afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Nacho Tuesday. And today I have Steve McGarry here with Kiss Metrics. He's a CEO, and I believe you're the founder over there too. Is that correct? Uh, CEO and recent uh, CEO, actually, this year. Oh, very exciting. Okay. Yeah, we'd love to learn more about Kiss Metrics for uh, people that haven't heard about it yet, which is probably very few because it's a well known brand. Uh, but we'd love to hear more about what Kiss Metrics does for any of the uninitiated, uninitiated out there. Yeah, sure. So we are a simple behavioral analytics platform that helps non-technical people really understand their users and their customers, helps them increase customer engagement, and in turn, drive more revenue and growth. Excellent. So uh, what got you to where you're at in your career? Uh, where did you start with all this and how did you end up becoming uh, the CEO of Kissmetrics? Yes. Yeah, so I sold my previous fintech company in 2015 to Max Levchin's company, Affirm. And that was long before they were uh, public, but Affirm was like a, or is a consumer finance company. Mm -hmm. And uh, they acquired us. And after that, I really learned a lot about the whole sales motion of a business there and learned all of the different aspects that go into selling to big and small enterprises um, and really just learn from the best there over the course of a few months after the exit and left there and started a kind of gaming focused uh, company mm -hmm. after that. And it was focused on analytics and that kind of led me into taking over as uh, CEO of Kissmetrics this year and nice. a lot of uh, exciting things coming. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, what got you into the uh, the gaming as aspect? Were you ever a fan of games or did you just uh, like the data and analytics side of it, which you seem to be proficient in? Yeah, I, I love, the, love the data side of things and really just empowering the creator side of things because the moment that I realized individuals could start deploying assets into different virtual experiences and things like that, it just totally changed my perspective of, of what a quote unquote game is. Um, so yeah, I love the data, but I also like the creativity that it now has for people. Excellent. Um, yeah, and as a seasoned entrepreneur, I'm sure a lot of our uh, founders and a lot of the C-suites to follow us would love to, you know, maybe learn from you about some, uh, you know, go to market strategies, maybe for their SaaS startups. Um, what are some key uh, data points that they should pay attention to as they're looking to get product market fit and grow their company? Yeah. Uh, so data points of, of how to kind of measure that, I think that partnerships like strategic partnerships that you can really work together with, you know, co-marketing, collaborating on content and things like that are great, just like what we're doing today. Uh, but I think with yeah. specifically around product market fit, you're really going to want to measure your NRR, like your yeah. net revenue retention. Like you need to make sure that people are coming back mm -hmm. and not only are they coming back, but they're paying more. They're willing to provide more value for what you've created. And that's a good indicator um, that you are on to product market fit when that NRR is is, is going over the 100% into the 110, 120% range. That's usually a good idea. And in the midst of what you could consider like a, a downturn over the last mm -hmm. 24 months in tech in general, it's combating churn, like churn and C contraction and everything that people have been dealing with, your NRR is going to be your lifesaver, basically, mm -hmm. like being able to rely on your best customers mm -hmm. and make sure they have a great experience and just really do your best to, to focus on your, your customer's needs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, churn is going to happen. It's just part of the business. But um, ultimately, that NRR number for, for product market fit, I think, is the best best way to measure. Nice. What are some other potential red flags that uh, startups could look out for that might indicate that, you know, maybe NRR might not be there, but uh, they might have some other metrics that might be uh, kind of trailing that they should look for to uh, identify if they have any problems with their product market fit? I think the, if, if your sales motion is up and running, like if you have a sales team <clears throat> working to set demos and onboard people, if you're noticing that there's just a very, very low win rate and you're not booking that many demos whatsoever, and it's a mm -hmm. struggle to really convince people of the value up front, yep. one, of the, one of the most powerful tools that I've found is note takers. 
So if you can have a note taker, there's plenty of them out there now. Mm -hmm. It's like a whole industry <laughs> that's yeah. been created, but record all your, your sales calls and you mm -hmm. will learn how to message your, your company, your product, just listen to potential customers and you can mm -hmm. basically reframe your whole product and your whole message just by listening to questions that prospects will, will present in sales yeah. calls. So I'd recommend using that as like a tool and, and figuring out how, how to really monitor that win rate to make sure that you're targeting the right people, the right ICPs, and you're actually, you're actually closing deals. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point because uh, those those calls could uh, you know warrant a lot of information if you're especially if you're listening and kind of watching the body behavior as well too. It's not always what people you know they might not tell you explicitly, but maybe the questions that they ask might uh, tell you a lot about what they're thinking, whether your, your product has the features that they're looking for or not, or maybe the way they react to uh, maybe the way you present a feature or what what have you. you could tell like people will give you like a like a visual like sign that they might be into something or they might be you know tuned out by something <laughs> the old classical eye roll if you will <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. you don't want those <laughs> exactly. um what are your thoughts on uh say product-led growth you know maybe as opposed to doing sales demos uh maybe for SaaS companies it might be leading more at the product design and trying to get uh, create more stickiness around the product and get people in the door and maybe with the freemium model and try to upsell them from there yeah yeah, yeah. so I think that when it comes to PLG, there's, there's a couple different approaches that people take and a lot of companies try to do it a little bit too soon. And one of the things that I've really prided our, our team on is that we want to help people with a human to human onboarding. We want to make sure that people are tracking what they need to be based on other companies in their, in their industry. Yeah. And we want to make sure that they're tracking the right things from day one. So yeah. We don't just want it to be a fully self-serve model where people are just on there and the risk of churn as a SaaS company is through the roof. If mm -hmm. people are just, uh, you know, signing up self-serve and it's a complex product, yeah. if you have an easy product like a Calendly or something, oh. yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can do this whole full PLG model, uh, where it's self-serve, but Ultimately, if it's a complex yeah. onboarding, which most really valuable mm -hmm. tools are uh, that I've utilized and a lot of people utilize in business, I think that there's there's something to be said about a human touch to help with yeah. onboarding, just providing that support. Yeah, and that's where the uh, demo calls come in to be really valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't don't ever leave people with uh, questions unanswered. You know, a lot of people still like to pick up the phone and just talk to somebody or you know spend 15, 20 minutes in a proper demo. Totally. Totally. Yeah. That human to human, just even if it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it may be, uh, just to solve some quick problems. Um, it's, we're trying to automate a lot of things in life right now. <laughs> Got to go back to the basics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just the basics. And you can automate things afterwards, of course, but just, just to get you comfortable and, and yeah. using something, sometimes that human to human touch is, is crucial. Yeah, it's important in the world world of automation. You know, a lot a lot of people are appreciating more of that human to human touch more. There was a point in automation, you know, a few years ago where it was kind of nice, but now it's now it's over the top. Everybody's trying to automate everything, especially with new AI tools and whatnot. Um, but the the ones that are really winning the day still try to you know put that human touch at the forefront of their uh, customer experience. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, so especially Definitely. at the beginning there. Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, where does data come from, right? <laughs> where are the sources that companies can really rely on the best data, um, you know, to make, to, to build their business strategies around, uh, what tools and sources are avail available for uh, startups to leverage today? Yeah. So outside of Kissmetrics, of course, um, <laughs> I think that something that's <clears throat> underrepresented in the space and it is a big company, but Stripe and utilizing Stripe, um, there are a lot of powers that be out there mm -hmm. specifically around financing that will leverage stripe to underwrite you so mm -hmm. if you're somebody that's building a business uh that's you know located somewhere in the world that doesn't really have access <laughs> to capital readily available like they're not in new york city or san francisco or chicago or something like that uh, the underwriting criteria has changed so if you're a startup that's doing solid MRR numbers, uh -huh. you can go on to these services like pipe 
or one of these different uh, financing options out there, plug in your Stripe and get access to lots of capital. And that's never really a data-driven due diligence process mm -hmm. has existed, but nothing that's just a few clicks with <clears throat> what Stripe offers. So mm -hmm. I recommend that in terms of a pipeline of a quick way of really increasing the value of your startup mm -hmm. um, is getting onto a, a new modernized financial instrument like Stripe that can process payments mm -hmm. and integrate with thousands of platforms. But specifically, if you need access mm -hmm. to funding to get things done, uh, I think that that yeah. is a, a key part to operating not only your data, but making sure that you're able to, to leverage it for, for the best of your business. That's a great point. Yeah, you, you brought up a uh, data is very important for the valuations of companies, like you just mentioned. Um, I guess what are some ways that startups can strategize around uh, create a data strategy to kind of increase the uh, the overall value for their company? Uh, do Do you have any tips around that? Yeah. So outside of you know using all modernized tools, I yeah. think that you you got to stay up to date on on modern tools. If you're using something that's outdated do the best that you can to invest in modernizing because that is going to increase the value of your company. If, if you are operating on very kind of legacy code, you really just need to take some time and catch up on that, uh, that debt. Basically you need to be able to, to update. So just using and updating, uh, you know, your, all of your infrastructure using things like a bookkeeper sounds kind of crazy. There is a new platform called puzzle that is really cool. Um, it's trying to kind of overthrow QuickBooks <laughs> and <laughs> nice. they've done a great job of it using AI to like automatically categorize things. Mm -hmm. And it plugs into, of course, Stripe and yeah. other um, platforms, but- yeah, Integrations are key. Yeah, integrations are key, but basically aggregating all the data that you can onto modern, modern infrastructure. Uh, with payments and tracking, bookkeeping and everything mm -hmm. will increase the value. Because if somebody asks you, hey, can I get access to a data room or can I get access to any information about your business? Mm -hmm. And you, you can't do that within yeah. a day or two days, the value just diminishes pretty, yeah. pretty dramatically. Um, so move fast and use modern tools basically yeah. with, with everything at your disposal. Yeah, and I think with data, you could provide a lot better services to your customers as well, too, right? So, you know, say, for instance, in our marketplace, you know, knowing more about our customers for like better software recommendations, but every every startup kind of has their own like niche way of being able to leverage data uh, to provide a better product experience as well, too, which also is very helpful for companies. Totally, totally. Yeah, data is the kind of uh, oil of the, the <laughs> this generation, you know, it is it is what moves moves all business around right now. Yeah, that's a great point because um, <clears throat> artificial intelligence isn't very intelligent without data. <laughs> so yeah, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, AI is a big buzzword right now, but you know, that all comes back to data too, of course. So true, true. Yeah. And, and making sure that, you know, you, you are positioned so that, like you said, the value of your company is pretty much correlated to <clears throat> your data and the tools that you use. And of course the, the momentum you have, but like, making sure that you're organized is very difficult in a world yeah. of like hundreds of tools. So simplifying it down, uh, the best that you can <clears throat> and making sure that it's secure and you should be really good, uh, should be able to value it, um, dramatically better if it's, if it's easy to, for you to manage, if it's super complex, yeah, it's, it's not as valuable. <laughs> yeah. And the CTOs hate that. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, have you ever heard of a company called Clearbit? Yeah, yeah. So what, what are your thoughts about kind of what what they offer as as, as far as a data model? Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong, but Clearbit is the one that verifies emails. Like, if I if I have an email and I sign up, and it it verifies. Um, yeah, that and it's got a lot of like like a lot of profile information on people and stuff like that. It's kind of crazy to think about, actually. Yeah, I mean things like Zoom Info and some of these big, almost like. Uh, NSA grade uh -huh. data repositories where people can go and subscribe and get access to just insane amounts of, of data. I think that 
you know, those companies are extremely valuable, but ultimately AI is going to determine the the multiple mm -hmm. of that, that valuation. Like if, if zoom info comes out with an AI product, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's automating a lot of the jobs of these SDRs that are out mm -hmm. there using it, yeah. you have a, a pretty dramatically more valuable company, but mm -hmm. making sure that, uh, you know, that's properly used and properly secured is, yeah. is a whole nother, <laughs> Whole, whole yeah. nother ball game, whole nother conversation. But we'll go down that in a different episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might bring in a cybersecurity expert too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, perfect. Uh, I guess can you give us some examples of some other companies maybe that uh, might be nailing it with their data strategy? Uh, companies that you look at, you know, outside of Kiss Metrics because you guys kind of help define the space, but um, other companies out there that might be doing a great job with it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot there's a lot. Of of really, really powerful, Stripe, yeah. powerful companies out there, but um, just to keep on the thread with with Stripe, why not? They they just did a thing called Link when we met with them um, in Toronto earlier this year. Mm -hmm. We met with their team, and they're doing this this concept where if I subscribe <laughs> using Stripe on one service like Uber, mm -hmm. I can use this Link concept that is an aggregate data of Uber users, and I can use that to pay for other services on Stripe. So it's almost like this one login payment using a pool of data of users. So all, all Uber users now can easily <laughs> log in and, and pay with ease uh, because wow. the, of the power of that system that is a network effectively yeah. for payments. So I just, I sound like I'm doing an ad for Stripe all of a sudden. But, um, they, <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> great, great businesses should be praised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they've, they've done just an incredible job of, of basically helping small businesses uh, get, get kicked off with just like one or two snippets of code. It's incredible yeah. how much they've disrupted in such a short period of time. Yep. And uh, do you have any examples, without naming names, of course, we like to keep keep it positive here, but companies that might have missed the boat on their data strategy, where maybe they got overtaken by a company because they were too slow to um, to adapt, I guess, without naming names, though, I guess. Oh, without naming names. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've heard of a lot of uh, a lot of companies that heavily heavily discount to try and stay. Um, stay above water and try and get out there. But ultimately, you know, people, people do ebb and flow with different, different markets and different industries and, and trends come and go web three really blew up in a big, big way in, yeah. um, I would say 2022, 2021 ish. And, you know, it's, it's been in big cycles, that whole space. And I love it very much. But it, it, it comes in and people misstep left and right, like a, a very recent one. We're not going to name names, but a very recent company raised $50 million and went out of business in under two years. So, I mean, oh, geez. Um, <laughs> in, order to, <laughs> in order to do that, I'm sure people watching this could could just Google that and figure that out. But, um, I, I know a couple, actually, so <laughs> they won't know which one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's the there's capital efficiency and then there's just like blatant um, you know, burning, burning money to burn it. And I think that there's, there's a lot over the last 24 months that I think are going to surface over the next five years of people that are like, wow, this was a total misstep in not only capital efficiency, but just data disaster. Um, yeah. so I don't want to hyper-focus on anybody specifically, but, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, broadly speaking, the, that uh, the Web3 space has, has seen a lot of um, implosion over the last year or so. Yeah, that and, and all, the, all those NFT portfolios too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a, it's been a tough, tough year or two years um, for, for the, the industry for sure. Definitely. Uh, I guess what other uh, data trends do you see out there? I mean, obviously AI is a big one, you know, give it as much information as possible. Uh, a lot of people are trying to figure out ways to take, you know, their... Uh, I guess their service and the data that they offer and plug it into AI. Uh, do you have any tips around that? Like how service providers uh, could, you know, utilize AI for their specific offerings? Yeah. Um, I think that the really interesting thing is if you go on ChatGPT and you, you search, if you have 
support documents out there uh, that have been out there for a few years, it, it literally will show up. Like if you search for Kissmetrics things, it'll show up with responses because of our support documents have been out there for so long. And I think that there's, there's so many unique approaches to it. But one thing that if a SaaS company is listening to this, um, if, if you are, you know, trying to find product market fit or you already have found it, checking your upgrades and your downgrades. So like the amount of customers that you see that are, uh, downgrading and, you know, you're trying to just bubble up the power users and your ambassadors within that group. I think that there's, there's not as much focus on that right now. And I think that there's a lot of AI solutions. I met with one in, in Toronto. I won't say their name mm -hmm. right now, but they ultimately were working on finding, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause we, we help people find power users, but they're really trying to do it with an AI, uh, component. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of interesting work going on here with figuring out who, who in your customer base and your user base should be bubbled mm -hmm. to the top and who you should be focusing on and who you should be providing, uh, you know, all the, all the different new initiatives early, um, almost like a affiliate on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody with a high net promoter score for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of really cool work being done on this. We're working on a lot of really fun aspects of, of, of this. And I know of other teams that are too. So, um, not to leak too much information, but definitely some exciting, um, things that are going to make it easier to dig in and, and find who's who. That's great. So uh, I guess that's a great point. So uh, I guess what tips would you offer for somebody to find maybe a super promoter or somebody, uh, a, a high value product user that they can uh, introduce these new features to and kind of work more closely with? Yeah. So outside of using Kissmetrics, uh, <laughs> you know, you can, you can definitely or, uh, go. Here's a tip. You could hack, hack it with Kissmetrics. So <laughs> yeah, you could hack it with Kissmetrics. <laughs> I think that there's, um, there's a few ways to, to track how people are really engaging. And, um, there's one really cool tool called spark Toro. I don't know how many people listening to this have, have heard of spark Toro, but the guy who made Moz, uh, created it mm -hmm. ran fish and it's basically like a sentiment social score. So you can identify, uh, different, you know, customers that have utilized mm -hmm. your platform, you can see where they are and what they're doing on social media and things like that. So there's a lot of cool tools that are coming out, um, and have been out mm -hmm. to identify it, but internally you're going to want to watch the NRR mm -hmm. and those mm -hmm. downgrades and upgrades. Uh, yeah. those are, those are the key, key metrics. And of course you can track your active users, but yeah. ultimately people who are sharing on social media and that they're upgrading, downgrading, uh, adding seats and, and just really falling in love with your product. That's something that, um, actually HubSpot did really well was just yep. focus on the customer, uh, delight yep. and they really did an incredible job of that, figuring out what people really, really needed and how to help, um, emphasize that. So they created their own ambassadors by mm -hmm. giving people exactly what they wanted. And it was, I follow a lot of the, the frameworks that they've set up over the years. Uh, but yeah, figuring out who, who's engaging, how they're engaging. Um, there's a lot of tools out there in addition to Kissmetrics uh, to, to do it. Yeah. I was just at a HubSpot inbound. It's, you know, it's kind of crazy how big a network, how big of a community can build by providing a great service and, you know, working hand in hand with your customers and, you know, they're big on these partner partner led initiatives as well too, which I think feeds a lot into it. Totally. Yeah. HubSpot's always been like this, this real beacon uh, of hope for SaaS. I feel like it's always just been this great example of a company that was, you know, Dinesh is, is one of the like greatest CTOs, I would argue of, of our generate of our time. And, and he's really made a great job of getting out there doing these awesome keynotes. I'd, I'd say he's probably one of the best keynote speakers ever. Um, he's humble too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally humble. And, just has set a good, a good standard for SAS in general, yeah. like how, how to, uh, really approach it for small businesses. Cause there's just a lot of people that don't focus on SMB and, yeah. um, that's near and dear to me as well as I'm sure a lot of people listening to this, but, yeah. um, yeah, I think that there's, there's a lot of work that, 
um, HubSpot does it's, it's fantastic, but there's also, you know, plenty of other incredible businesses out there like Shopify that do great work with SMBs too. Yeah, that's a great point. You kind of grow together. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So in Microsoft too, you know, kind of the OG for partners, uh, developing, you know, strong partnership networks and everything, but yeah, HubSpot's one of the more recent ones. I think that have really just nailed their strategy there. Salesforce has done pretty good at it too. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of great great examples to look forward to, uh, look up to there. Um, mm. I guess you know after you get product market fit, what tips do you offer for a company to really start scaling? Uh, you have your super ambassadors or promoters, you know your high value customers. You got the wheels turning here. Uh, wh where do you look to next to really start to scale your business, especially using data uh, the data at your hands? Yeah, yeah. So there's a new buzzword in, in town. Uh, David Sachs coined it, I think, um, but it's called the burn multiple. And mm -hmm. the burn multiple is a really great high level way of looking at how a, a business spends its money. And basically if I burn $1, <laughs> I add $1 in net new ARR mm -hmm. and that's a one. So a burn multiple of one means I put a mm -hmm. dollar in, I get a new $1 in ARR. And this is, you know, in an early startup, maybe you're at like one and a half or something because you're, you're burning more money and you're trying to add and you're trying to grow really quickly and you have to scale the team and the amount of burn is just higher. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, the later stage that you get after you've hit product market fit and the later you get in the cycle, you should get that multiple down lower is really the concept. And I think it's a beautiful example mm -hmm. of a simple number or a simple metric that you can use to really track every aspect of the efficiency of the company, whether it's the, the amount of new ARR that's being added, the amount of burn that's going to the size of the team and the headcount. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a very simplified boiled down way of looking at a, a company from a 30,000 foot view. And I think for everybody listening to this, that, that mm -hmm. is at that stage where they're starting to hire a couple account executives, they're starting to hire, uh, you know, a CMO, or they're trying, starting to really turn on the jets with ad advertising. It is key to manage that burn, um, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're adding a dollar for every dollar that you're, mm -hmm. you're burning, uh, in net new ARR. But that's kind of my take on a really cool new new high level metric that I think everyone should be monitoring. Yeah. Gone are, gone are the days of just burning money and easy, easy money too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Easy yeah. come, easy go, as they say too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess what are some of your favorite books? You know, uh, if somebody wants to kind of jumpstart their knowledge as an, uh, as an entrepreneur or a, an executive and kind of, you know, uh, forego some of the failures that maybe uh, us entrepreneurs go through sometimes on our own, uh, just by learning from the experts, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah. Um, I think that Atomic Habits is a great book. If you guys haven't read that, definitely check that out. Um, really, really powerful way of, of, you know, developing habits. It basically says like, you know, you can make it, make a habit obvious, make it attractive, make it easy and make it really satisfying. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of value to that, uh, so that you can kind of control your, your surroundings and there's a lot of things you can't control as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So controlling your habits and your immediate surroundings are a really good way to, to do it. Um, and I think it's, uh, hard things about hard things, um, is, is the one by Ben Horowitz. I love, love everything, um, th in that book, just because it, it truly encapsulates like the, the hardship of, uh, being an entrepreneur and, there's a lot of really cool knowledge nuggets in that. Uh, yeah. And also, you know, for all the parents are listening, I have a, a three-year-old <laughs> and um, there's a, uh, not a lot of books on like <laughs> entrepreneur parents, uh, which I yeah. think is interesting. It's a, it's a cool category, but uh, there's one called Good Inside that, 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 that I read that was really good this year. Um, but definitely authors that are listening to this need to start writing <laughs> in that category. I, I would agree with that actually. Yeah. There could be a lot more books around like, you know, kind of teaching your kids some of the basic lessons in a kind of a fun childish way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a really interesting space that, that there's not, not very much content on, uh, for well, sure. 
uh, great ideas are meant to be spread. So hopefully somebody uh, grabs that and uh, runs with it. <laughs> <laughs> no chat GPT written books, though. This has got to be original. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, perfect. So what's next for Kissmetrics? Uh, what should we look forward to over the next few years? Yes. Yeah, so we have a lot of partnerships mm -hmm. rolling out. A uh, big one in November that's going to be announced. Uh, that'll be everywhere. And then we have a whole slew of integrations rolling out over the next six months. So we've had hundreds, if not over a thousand different inquiries from customers, community members, all different types of people that want different functionalities. So we've been working uh, diligently around the clock to get these nice. done and they're going to get out at the beginning of 2024. So mm -hmm. Definitely give us a follow. Uh, mainly we're on LinkedIn and Twitter and things like that, but we're rolling out a ton of different new integrations that aren't really done uh, by a lot of different companies out there. So I think it's going to be a really fun year next year with a lot of new features and, and integrations that many aren't expecting. I'll say, uh, yeah. that have to do with my background, uh, that I mentioned previously in the interview and, nice. um, just analytics in general. Well, uh, very much looking forward to it. Make sure we're in the know, <laughs> um, you, you know, as soon as possible there. And it sounds like you practice what you preach. I mean, I heard the word integrations a bunch of times and uh, I heard listening to customers. So uh, it's good that you, uh, to see you putting that into practice as well, too. So uh, very excited for the uh, new feature updates when they when they come about. I'm sure they're going to be a smashing success. For sure. Yeah, I'm excited to work with Nacho Nacho and, and uh, get it out there. And um, yeah, excited to be working with you guys as well. Likewise, Steve, I really appreciate it. Anybody interested in Kiss, uh, Kiss Metrics, so feel free to check them out on their website um, or feel free to check them out in the Nacho Nacho B2B SaaS marketplace. Uh, Steve, once again, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you and uh, we look forward to uh, le learning more or growing together as a company, actually, we, uh, especially with our product-led growth initiatives. Uh, for us, the rise rising tide raises all boats. So happy to be on the same ship with you. <laughs> for sure. Thanks so much for having me, Andy. Thanks, you too.